So most people who have any connection with MS know about MRI scans. So you, you lie in the MRI scan and you can um, get pictures of the lesions and you can get pictures of the size of the brains. With more powerful scanners, so the, the scanners are rated in numbers and most of the scanners would be 1.5 or 3T. You can actually get, get very much more powerful scanners and you can give much more powerful contrast and see more lesions. But in addition, you can also um, use special alternative techniques to see abnormalities in, in the part of the brain called the grey matter, which is not normally shown up, so that's by using alternative techniques. And it's possible to do a thing called MR spectroscopy, if there's any engineers or people who know. It's, it's, a, it's a way to actually tune your machine using different kinds of coils to actually identify chemicals in the brain. So with that technique, it's going to be possible to peer into bits of the brain that are seemingly normal. It's going to be possible to look at metabolism in the brain. After the immune attack, there, there is loss of tissue and, and permanent irreversible scarring. And the cause of that is not fully understood. But one of, the, um, one of the things that is put up is that it's got something to do with energy metabolism and mitochondria. And with fancy techniques, you can actually see energy metabolism in the brain. Similarly, um, with what's called PET scanning, which, which is a nuclear technology, it's possible to um, practically look at cells. You can identify certain kinds of cells, so it's possible to see activation of the, the microglia, the... Um, one, one of the cells in the brain, and you can see how they change using special stains. So I'm, I'm not an imaging person at all by training, but I'm just absolutely gobsmacked by the potential of this. And we do have imaging people. Queensland is extremely strong. It's always been a pioneer in imaging. But it's a very expensive um, thing to do. It requires big centres, big machines. ask Pam if you could sort of talk about these two drugs. We know one of them has uh, got through the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia already and we know the other has got through the Federal Drug Administration in America already. So these drugs are sort of poised to enter the market in Australia. Pam, could you tell us about these two new oral treatments? So one's called cladribine, the other is called fingolimod. Um, cladribine is the drug that's actually been approved it's, it's a drug that is an immune drug and it um, damages T cells. So it's an immunosuppressive drug. It's very strong. It's certainly been shown to be extremely effective. Um, one of the issues that we're all going to have with these new strong drugs is, you know, just safety concerns that have to be looked out for. So I don't think anyone will be really saying, oh, wow, new drug, let's use it very widely. I think it'll be very measured the way it might be considered to be introduced. But it certainly seems to be very powerful. The other one is called Fingolimod, which is um, an extremely interesting drug. It doesn't actually um, destroy white blood cells. What it does is it stops them from getting out of the, um, the lymph node where they're, where they're made into the bloodstream. And so they can't, they're trapped basically. They're trapped trapped in the, in the lymph node, they're still there, they're still alive, but they can't wriggle out and get into the brain. And it too has gone through it, its trials pretty well. Um, it, it is a very interesting drug because the receptor that is blocked to keep, the, um, to keep the cells in the lymph node may well have something to do with the brain as well. And as we'll all know, um, we... we you know, we want to suppress the immune side of things, but we'd also like to do something that's good for the brain cells and the brain tissue. Cladribine, I think, is given as a course, you know, over a couple of weeks, once a year. The fingolimod is, is given like a more regular kind of a drug. So, yeah, it's very exciting that there are tablets coming, but, but I think we should certainly stress that when any new drug comes along, we just don't want to kind of use it very widely until we're quite comfortable with its safety profile. We hear of a number of different places where simply healthy diet is clearly helpful for the general health of 
people they miss and people they didn't miss. But Pam? In terms of diet, I think the thing Australia's about to do is show that you, you know, your diet should include, include some vitamin D capsules. I guess that's, that's probably one important thing. But I'm not aware of any actual trial trials that, that show the low-fat diet is good. But, but, I mean, of course, if you have MS, you should, should still be healthy, so you should be on the cardiac diet. Plus, there are theoretical reasons to think it would be good for this endothelial activation because the, the inside of blood vessels in, in coronary artery disease and in stroke, that the, exactly the same molecules are involved as are involved in, in letting white blood cells get into the brain. So, yeah, a healthy, heart-wise kind of diet is, is probably what everyone, I guess, would recommend. 